Welcome to worship. We're coming to you from the Sanctuary of Faith Presbyterian Church of East Wenatchee, Washington. I'm Pastor Jim Deal, and I'm delighted that you're joining us for this worship experience. I'm joined by Ron and Jeannie Lodge, our music ministers, and we want to go ahead and begin worship with the song, Whom Shall I Fear? strength is in your name for you alone can say you will deliver me yours is the victory whom shall Thank you so much, Ron and Jeannie. We so appreciate your music ministry. Let us continue our worship with prayer. Lord God, we are so thankful that with you, we have nothing to fear. For you are our comfort, you are our strength, you are our hope. You pour forgiveness and grace upon us. May your presence be felt by each person experiencing this worship. Help us to shut out the cares and concerns of the world and give us ears and eyes to hear your word to us this day. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We want to continue our worship as we sing the song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Why? 
Dissolve like snow, the sun for that to shine. The God who called me here below will be forever mine. My chains are. Thank you again, Ron and Jeannie. What a wonderful song with a wonderful message. Amazing grace. My chains are gone. Our scripture reading uh, this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 36 through verse 50, the end of the chapter. Listen for God's word to you as I read. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Now the Pharisee who had invited him saw it. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. And Jesus said, a certain creditor had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven, 
hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's the end of our scripture reading. The story is told of a Sunday school teacher who had just concluded her lesson and wanted to make sure that the children grasped the, the subject matter and her main point. So she said, Can anyone tell me what you must do before you obtain forgiveness of sin? There's a short pause, and then from the back of the room, a small boy spoke up. Sin, he said. Well, that may be a funny story, but believe it or not, is relevant to our scripture story today. Because we're tackling the subject of sin and how our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ expresses compassion for sinners and offers them forgiveness. I want to look again at this story, beginning at verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him and went to the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And the woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating at a Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. She continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. I think Luke, the gospel writer here, is kind of setting up a contrast. This Pharisee invites Jesus and, and offers Jesus a place at his table. But this woman of the city comes in and she's uninvited. She is not a guest. But she brings something with her. She brings an alabaster jar of ointment. She stands behind him, not in front of him, but behind him at his feet, weeping. Why? We don't know exactly why she's weeping. Perhaps there's a lot of sadness in her life. Perhaps she is sorry for her sins. Perhaps she feels the weight of other people's judgment, their judging eyes. In the end, we don't know why she cries. But in a sense, it doesn't matter because her tears are sincere and she's crying in the presence of Jesus. She bathes Jesus' feet with her tears and anoints his feet with the ointment from her jar. The story continues at verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she's a sinner. And I think in his mind, if he really knew who she was, there's no way he would have anything to do with her. He would push her away. He would reject her. The Pharisee immediately jumps to judgment. He judges Jesus, believing that he's maybe not a true prophet, because if he was, he would know this woman's background. And yet his most serious and harshest judgments, I think, are reserved for the woman for the Pharisee, this woman's identity is obliterated by her sins. In other words, he cannot get past her sins he, to see her as a person. He only sees the sins that she has committed or is alleged to have committed among the gossip of the town, one would assume. Essentially, he labels her. He labels her as a sinner. And one might add, he labels her as an unredeemable and unforgivable sinner. But the unwritten subtext here is that he consequently labels himself in a positive light. Like me, I'm not a sinner. I'm better than sinners like her. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, I think many of us fall into this trap of weighing our sins and weighing the sins of someone else and saying, well, 
I may not be perfect, but you know, just look at my small sins compared to that person's heavy, excessive sins. They, they've sinned ten times worse than I have. Why do we do that? I think it's sometimes to puff ourselves up, but it may also be because it is messy to show love like this woman was doing. She was probably making Simon the Pharisee, the host, a little uncomfortable and maybe the other guests as well. And here you have this very public display of affection and devotion. And she was also crying. And you have to be comfortable with tears in public, tears which may make some of those who see them uncomfortable. The story goes on at verse 40. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. I think Jesus says this in order to make sure he has Simon's full attention. He's not, this is not going to be a, a passing comment. This is not just a throwaway teaching. This is going to be something very important. He wants to make sure that he has Simon's full attention. And wonderfully, Simon gives it to him and invites Jesus to speak. Now, Jesus, as he often does with difficult subjects, he attacks it in kind of a, an indirect manner through use of a parable. And he tells this parable. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered this question, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Jesus' parable, in a very subtle way, begins to crumble the Pharisees' judgments and his arguments. How does it do that? Well, first of all, he kind of levels the playing field. There are two debtors. They both owe a debt. They fall into the same category. They're not, they're not creditors. They are both debtors. Now, Jesus acknowledges that there's a vast difference between the amount that they owe, but the truth is that they both owe a debt. There's not one of them that doesn't owe a debt. And also, it's a debt that neither of them can pay on their own. Without the grace of the creditor, they are both hopelessly in debt forever. Now, amazingly and miraculously and wonderfully, the creditor forgives both debts. He forgives not only the one who owes him a little, but also the one who owes him a lot. Both are forgiven. So Jesus, once again, is subtly letting Simon know that perhaps he has far more in common with this woman than he would like to admit. For both were debtors who could not pay, and both are now forgiven. But Jesus is not done. He poses a question to Simon, the Pharisee. And his question is this. Which of the two do you think loves the creditor more? Well, the Pharisee is no dummy. He provides the obvious answer. I suppose the one who had had the greater debt forgiven. And Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, has turned the discussion on its head. No longer is this a discussion about who sinned more. No, this is a discussion about who loves the forgiving creditor more. What would our world look like? if instead of wondering who is the greatest sinner in our world, have everybody pointing fingers at one another, what if instead we spent our time wondering who loved God the most? Verse 44. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. She has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. 
You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Jesus now shifts his attention directly to the woman, and he points not to her past sins, but to her present actions. And one might say that Jesus correctly points out that where Simon the Pharisee has played a poor host, she, believe it or not, has made up for his shortcomings. Hospitality was and still is a very valued virtue in that culture. Still an important virtue even in our culture. And washing the feet of guests, dinner guests, would have been most welcome. It was hot and dry there. Streets were filled with dust and all manner of garbage. Most people walked barefoot or wore sandals at the most. So feet became very dirty easily. Would have been welcome the opportunity to wash one's feet. And greeting one another with a kiss was common in that culture, the way it's still common in Russia and in a lot of Eastern European countries. We have a similar thing, or at least we did, handshakes. And Simon the Pharisee also, besides not offering to wash Jesus' feet or give him a kiss on the cheek, also does not anoint Jesus' head with oil. But the woman has not stopped anointing Jesus' feet, his feet which would have been dirty and dusty and not the most pleasant, but out of devotion, she anoints his feet with the oil in that alabaster jar, precious ointment. Jesus was making the point that the woman was expressing his love, her love for him, while Simon in all honesty, was quite limited in his love for Jesus. Yes, it's true he had invited Jesus to his table and was serving him food, but beyond that, he apparently, particularly for the norms of that culture, he was not a great host. But Jesus isn't done with the situation. He very pointedly, he addresses the application of his parable to the situation at hand. Verse 47, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, her sins which were many have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Jesus is telling Simon, Look, I, I realize that the way she is expressing her love for me, her very demonstrative way, or her tears and and, you know, weeping and all that, all that is making you uncomfortable. But you need to see that for what it is. It's a grateful expression of love for forgiving her sins, which he admits are many. In essence, he is saying, was saying to Simon, her forgiveness is great, but also her love for me is great. Get over it, Simon. And then Jesus makes an observation, a true observation, and one which, if Simon is paying attention, may be a little painful for him. He says, the one who is forgiven little, loves little. And in my mind's eye, when those words hit Simon's ears, I see the hair on the back of his neck standing up a little bit, because... He knows who Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about him. And the way he, which he's been the host, but he's not been very hospitable to Jesus. I think Jesus lets that comment sink in to Simon. But then Jesus does something remarkable. Instead of just speaking about the woman, he speaks the woman. This is something that Simon has not done and would never do in a million years. For Simon, the woman's past sins make her essentially a non-person. But Jesus sees beyond the sin to the person, the woman, the child of God behind the sins. 
and he addresses her, speaking directly to her. So what does he say? Verse 48. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Some of those powerful words of assurance that anyone can offer to anyone. Your sins are forgiven. She came to Simon's house, burdened down by her past sins, perhaps by her ruined life, certainly carrying a terrible reputation. All of this, I think, weighed upon her mightily. And now Jesus has just lifted that burden of sin off of her by saying, your sins are forgiven. Wow. It is a great moment. At least I think it's a great moment, and I think many of us do, but apparently not everybody there thought so. Read on, verse 49. But those who were at table with Simon began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? Simon and his friends are apparently uncomfortable with the forgiveness that Jesus offers to this woman. And so they focus in upon Jesus, wondering if he has the authority, the requisite authority, to forgive sins. In some ways, this is a very ironic question because they are so quick to judge sin and condemn sinners but they quibble over one who offers forgiveness and release from condemnation and judgment all of this in spite of the fact that jesus had reminded them in a subtle way that they too really everyone at that table besides himself was a debtor when it came to god they all stood in need of God's forgiveness. I think there may be a part of Simon and the other Pharisees there at the table, very deep down, which they don't believe that this woman deserves forgiveness. There may even be a, 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 a mean and wicked part of them that doesn't want to see this woman receive forgiveness so that they may, can maintain their stereotypes which apparently offer them some comfort in feeling better than she is. But the woman's fate is not in their hands. It's in the hands of Jesus. And Jesus is not quite done speaking to the woman. He has one more important word for her, verse 50. And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He offers words of assurance to the woman. Your faith has saved you. Not your works have saved you, but your faith in being forgiven, that has saved you. You are no longer unforgiven. You are no longer lost in sin. You have been found in me and by my love. You are saved from your sin. You are not saved by your works, but by the fact that your works express to me your love for me and your forgiveness that you have honestly received it. They expressed the woman's gratitude for sins forgiven. And then he releases the woman, saying to her, Go in peace. Where the Pharisee Simon, if he could say anything to the woman, would say, Stay in condemnation or stay in judgment. Jesus doesn't do that. He says, go in peace. Simon offers the woman judgment and condemnation, treating her as inferior and hopeless. But Jesus offers her compassion and forgiveness and, yes, blessing. Wonderful. Is it any wonder that people were drawn to Jesus because of his hopeful message of forgiveness? Consequently, they were drawn away from the Pharisees and the judgment and two-faced and, and, and 
the, the guilt that they received from the Pharisees. They were not drawn to that at all. They were drawn to the forgiveness and love and compassion that Jesus offered them. And at the end of the day, I think what we all need, every single one of us, is not more condemnation and not more judgment. No, what we long for, what we live for, is to hear those wonderful words, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Go in God's peace. And that is the kind of love that will cause us to barge into a dinner party uninvited, to express our love graphically and messily, regardless of who's embarrassed because of God's abundant forgiveness for us and for our sins. I want to ask you, what would you do if someone take, took away the, the label upon your life of sinner and changed it and gave you the title of saved? You'd probably be so grateful you'd do anything and everything for the person who changed that label on your life. This woman is a notorious sinner, but she shows great love for Jesus and is forgiven by him. His compassionate forgiveness is a wonderful message for all of us. Fortunately, there are those who follow Jesus who express compassionate forgiveness even to sinners and even to notorious sinners. Jim Baker was an evangelist whose downfall involved sex and hush money, defrauded investors. He was sentenced to five years in prison. He really brought suspicion on all televangelists and all evangelists of all kinds. But in spite of that, a great evangelist, Billy Graham, and his wife, they showed incredible love and compassion for Jim Baker. When he was released from prison, they invited Jim to their house for dinner. And during the course of dinner, um, they asked Jim for a couple of addresses. And so he, he got, reached into, his, uh, into his, his pants pocket and pulled out an envelope. And he pulled out the addresses that they wanted and, and shared them with them. And, and Ruth said, somewhat shocked, well, Jim, don't, don't you have a wallet? And Jim said, well, of course not. This is what I have. I I've been in prison. You're not allowed to have a wallet in prison because it could be hiding a shiv or contraband or something, so you're not allowed to. So everybody uses envelopes as wallets, and, and here he was out of prison still using an envelope. Ruth was shocked at this news and immediately got up from the dinner table, went into the other room, and came back and handed Jim a wallet. He said, this is one of Billy's old wallets. He doesn't need it anymore. Keep it. And that's not the only sign of forgiveness that they offered to Jim. They, they rented him a house. They gave him a car to use. But one of the greatest gifts came the following Sunday. On the first Sunday he was out of prison, Ruth called up the halfway house where Jim Baker was living, a Salvation Army halfway house, and, and, and gained permission for Jim to attend worship at their church, at Montreat Presbyterian Church. Jim got to the church, and he describes it this way. When I got there, the pastor welcomed me and sat me with the Graham family. There were like two whole rows of them. I think every Graham aunt and uncle and cousin were there. The organ began playing, and the place was full, except for the seat next to me. Then the doors opened, and in walked Ruth Graham. She walked down that aisle and sat next to inmate 0740059. I'd only been out of prison 48 hours, but she told the world that morning that Jim Baker was her friend. My friends, that is the good news this morning. That when Jesus looks at us, he takes away the label of sinner and changes it to saved, or maybe even better yet, saved friend. And 
the good news this day and every day is that Jesus is not our enemy or the accuser of our sins. No. He is our Savior, and He is the friend of sinners. He's my friend, and He's your friend. He came to save the sins of all on this road. Hallelujah and amen. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we are so thankful that your son was not like Simon the Pharisee, offering judgment and condemnation and reminding us of all the ways that we have fallen short. We thank you that you offer us compassion and love and forgiveness. Lord, we know we don't deserve that forgiveness, but we are so very, very grateful for it. And Lord, as we interact with our friends and neighbors, help us to express your love and forgiveness to them. For that is indeed the word that the world needs to hear. May we be agents of forgiveness and love and peace in our world. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now I'd like to make a couple of announcements before our closing blessing and our last song. First, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this online worship experience. We're so grateful for your presence with us and your taking the time out of your busy lives to, to share this time with us. And if you want to see more worship services or learn more about our church, you're welcome to visit our website, faithpresseco.org. Uh, we're also on Facebook, and so you're welcome to become a friend of ours on Facebook. Just do a search for Faith Presbyterian Church of East Wenatchee. I would encourage you to do so. Also, if you've been blessed by this service and by our church, I would encourage you to consider donating to our church and there's a uh, section on our church website that tells you how you can do that, um, either through an online uh, gift or also um, using the, the old-fashioned snail mail to our physical address. Um, also, if this service has blessed you, feel free to share it with others. We want the word to go out to others, a word of, of good news and hope in this uh, world in which we live in. Also, um, even though things are beginning to change and reopen, uh, we're not quite allowed to offer... Um, in-person worship in our church sanctuary. So please plan on joining us um, next Sunday for our online worship service. And even once um, we are able to offer in-person worship, we plan to continue to worship, to offer ministry online. So please plan to join us for the foreseeable future and indeed forever. Um, now in a moment, we're going to sing our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. But first, receive the closing blessing. As you go forth out into the world from this worship experience, wherever you have shared it, in your home, in your apartment, wherever, serve God in all that you say and everything that you do. And know that the incredible and wonderful love of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with you on this Sunday, throughout the coming week, and indeed forevermore. Go in peace. We'll now sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. For we weak and heavy laden, comfort with the load of care. Precious Savior, still our rest.